بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Ask Iman broadcasted live from the London studio of Iman channel on Sky 757 We're also streaming it live on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel So please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to all our platforms including our Facebook page, our YouTube channel You can follow us on our Twitter handle and of course you can follow us on our Instagram page We're streaming it live via our website too imanchannel.tv since it's a live interactive Q&A program 0203-515-0757 our studio number 0791684143 our WhatsApp number and of course international viewers can use the WhatsApp number to call in directly into the studio I'm your host Qamar al-Islam joining us tonight virtually none other than internationally renowned scholar Fadilat al-Sheikh Bilal Ismail Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hayakullah doctor how are you Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair, as always, for giving us your valuable time. Now, I'd like to go on straight to our question. Now, uh, Day of Arafah on Friday, does it hold any special position in Islam? Excellent. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka al-abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. I welcome our dear brothers and sisters in al-Islam. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. We are now living in the best of days. Walhamdulillah. And our questioner states that uh, Arafah falling on a Friday, is there any special significance related to this? As some call it Hajj al-Akbar, mashallah. This year they say, this is Hajj al-Akbar. I performed Hajj and that year it was Hajj al-Akbar. We state that uh, directly from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we do not find that there is a specific extra virtue with regards to Arafah falling on the day of Friday. But our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the year that he performed Hajj, the year that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Hajj, that year, the day of Arafah fell on a Friday. So at least psychologically, emotionally, alhamdulillah, I'm so happy that the year I'm performing Hajj coincided with the similar days of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, the mere fact that the day of Arafah is on a Friday, we know on a Friday consciously, we are more in tune with regards to matters. And so most people, the fact that this is a Friday plus it is the day of Arafah, uh, then bi ta'ala, there's, we hope, inshallah, there's extra khair and barakah. And this pushes people to do more, inshallah. Jade, let's see. Like a minimum, a minimum would be Surah al Kahf. A minimum would be sending extra salawat upon the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which people do on a Friday. Well, now that it's the day of Arafah, I can tell you that many hujjaj who might not have recited Surah Al-Kahf, you know, the number of pages of Surah Al-Kahf, many hujjaj might have recited three pages of Quran and Arafah, four pages. But because it's Friday, they're reading more, mashallah, they're reciting Surah Kahf, which they are accustomed to and they are used to. So for those other benefits, we hope, inshallah, that it is better for the haji, inshallah. But if somebody is saying, uh, uh, is there a hadith or verse of the Noble Quran that if you perform Hajj or, and it's uh, Arafah and it's on Friday, then this equals 10 Hajj or this equals 20 Hajj or it equals performing Hajj with Ibrahim alayhi salam? No, we don't have anything like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Thank you very much for that clarification. Next, uh, what's the difference between Udhiyah and Qurbani? Just uh, briefly, we've touched upon it uh, for some time, but just uh, briefly because it's that time of the month. Uh, any difference or is it the same? Jayid, Udhiya means an uh, for a person to sacrifice something. And Qurbani means my sacrifice. Jayid, same thing. Jayid, what's the ahkam and the ruling with regards to Qurbani? What's the ahkam and the ruling with regards to Udhiya? It's either, either, it's tomato, tomato. It's the exact same thing, different terms. You find generally uh, amongst the Arabs, they would term it Udhiya. And amongst uh, those of the Indian subcontinent, etc., uh, they would term it Qurbani. But it's the same thing. This is different from what the Haji does. That is called Hadi. Hadi, not Udhiya. Not Qurbani, the Haji is doing something called the Hadi. Hadi, the animal which is slaughtered, that's the Hadi animal. Thank you very Allah much. Zakallah khair. Uh, what type of animal uh, can we offer when it comes to Udhiya? Jail, excellent. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so your goats, 
your sheep, your cows, your camels, your uh, bulls, uh, bison, uh, all of these here would suffice, would be valid ta'ala with regards to qurbani, with regards to udhiyah, insha'Allah. What's most common and most available? Uh, it's your goats, it's your sheep, uh, your cows are important. The cow equals seven shares. The camel equals seven shares. The bison equals seven shares. The bull equals seven shares. Whereas the goat or the sheep equal one share. Now, what does that mean? That means that, uh, uh, for example, Ahmed. Ahmed, he is slaughtering one Udhiya for himself. So he slaughtered that animal and that animal for himself. But if he had a cow, the cow could have been for seven different individuals. So that's, and obviously we know the meat from a cow much, much more. The price of the cow is much more expensive. And thus that equals seven, the camel equals seven. And the others we mentioned, the goat and the sheep equal one share. Wallahu ta'ala alam. So that is only cattle that we can offer for Qurbani or here. Yes. So for example, somebody says, well, uh, you know, my mom, she has some kids, some, 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 some chickens in the yard. We have a rooster. We have a hen. Can I slaughter? Uh, so somebody says, generally halal animals we can slaughter for qurbani. No, 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 no. Jay, the rabbit is halal. You can't slaughter a rabbit. For qurbani, the chicken, the duck, uh, the rooster, you cannot slaughter this here for uh, for qurbani. Rather, as you have mentioned, it is your cattle. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, next, uh, if the animal is in your compound and the udhiyah is supposed to take place in a couple of hours, can we take advantage from it? For example, can we milk the cow or trim the sheep, etc.? No problem at all. No problem at all. So somebody has purchased this uh, cow. He's got it there for three months. He's been milking it, masha'Allah. No problem at all. What, what else is he to do? Is that not the right thing to do, insha'Allah? And so you can milk it. You can benefit from it. You can play with it. Uh, no issue at all. And uh, similarly, with regards to the will of the sheep, etc., uh, you can benefit from this. I mean, at the end of the day, once the animal is slaughtered, can you not eat from its meat? Of course. Is that not what you're going to do? Or is that, that's exactly what you're going to do, inshallah. You're going to eat some keep for your family, give to your family, give to your friends, give to the Muslims, give to the non-Muslims. That's what we're going to do. So even benefit before that, no problem at all. Uh, for those of us who have got family in our country of origin and here, what's best in terms of giving Udhiyah here or abroad or both places? Jayid, excellent. Uh, more the merrier. Jayid, more the merrier. Think about this. Our Habib, our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during his Hajj, he had slaughtered 100 camels. How many shares equal in one camel? How many shares do you get from one camel? Seven shares, seven shares. So that means our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had 700 shares, 700 shares slaughtered, subhanAllah. Is he going to eat all of that? 100 camels he's going to eat? No, it's for distribution. Let the people eat, distribute to the people, give to the people. Let people be happy and merry make, masha'Allah. And so let us not be misers, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. If you can afford, underline if, if you can afford, then have animals slaughtered back in your home country, have animals slaughtered in your area so that your kids, your people, your family, they also get to experience udhiyah. They get to experience this qurbani. Otherwise, well, otherwise, if you went for Salatul Eid and you came home and you were watching some TV and you got together with the family. But where was the slaughter? Where was the watching? Where was... In many families, this is like a dying practice, a dying practice, unfortunately, Jade. And, and, and if you can afford in Africa, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Asia, in many countries, maybe send some here, send some there, Palestine, send all over. The more you can, the merrier. Your Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had 700 shares slaughtered. Where are you from him? Allah Mustafa. Uh, this time of the year, critics of Islam, become uh, they become very active in terms of uh, how barbaric it is that we slaughter <coughs> animal for sacrifice. As Muslim, how do we respond? Jamil, 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 Jayid. So there's... Uh... You know, in, in Arabic, they state that, uh, that the barking dog does not harm the clouds. 
So there's a barking dog. He's looking at the cloud and he's barking and barking and barking and he's screaming and shouting as if he is going to hurt the cloud. No, barking dog, you keep barking and it will not affect the cloud at all. And as some have said, the reality is with the barking dog barking at the clouds, it's only but the saliva, the spit, which then comes back onto the dog's face. So Allah Musta'an, I don't know if that is an appropriate response, you know, for your channel, etc., etc., with your with your many disclaimers, Dr. Kamar uh, uh, Islam. But nonetheless, yes, you do find, and unfortunately, this idea is catching up with many Muslims. You find many Muslim writers, newspapers, etc., oh, why are we slaughtering animals? Rather, we should take the money and uh, uh, build uh, orphanages, and we should build roads somewhere else and we should send no no subhanallah this is an act of ibadah there's a time Sheikh, and there's a place for everything Sheikh, i'll pause you there because it's time for a short break and there is a question related to that because of the recent flooding that has taken place in india and bangladesh and there are certain opinions that are doing rounds on social media i'll inshallah come to that and of course we'll also cover the aspect of criticism uh, when we have got a lot of fast food chains they are delivering millions of burgers foods etc <laughs> when it comes to animal product. But when it comes to our Eid, there's always that question. Inshallah, we'll continue after a short break. You're watching Ask Iman, live on Iman channel. Thank you very much.
Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757 in conversation with Sheikh Bilal Ismail. We're also streaming it live on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. You can follow us on our Twitter handle. And of course, we also have Instagram page. We are streaming it live via website too, imanchannel.tv. 0203-515-0757, our studio number 0791684148. The time is slightly different today. However, inshallah, from next week, we'll be back again at our usual time between 8 to 9. Ask Iman live, always on your channel, uh, on Iman channel Sky 7. Five, seven. Sheikh, we were discussing about the critics of Islam and how this time is used. We see on social media about how Islam is barbaric when it comes to offering sacrifices in cattle. But also at the same time, we know a lot of big fast food chains, they slaughter millions of chicken, sheep, goat, BM cows, whatever it is. And Alhamdulillah, whether in eastern part or western part of the world, there's a huge market for burgers, etc. So that is not an issue. Only one day of the year, it becomes an issue for Muslim. And also you were talking about, um, we have seen in recent time where the, unfortunately, sadly, India, Bangladesh and other neighboring countries have been affected by severe flooding, where there is discussion already on social media. Why do we need to offer Qurbani this year? Why don't we, instead of um, offering Qurbani, help the needy with the money that we are going to put towards Qurbani? If you can just combine it both and then we'll move on to our next question, inshallah. Jade, excellent. Jazakallah khair, Doctor. Uh, so we say that, subhanAllah, uh, you look at the rules and regulations related to Islam. Islam states that one should be very uh, caring when it comes to the animal, when it comes to the time of slaughter. You need to have a nice, sharp knife. Don't allow this animal to see another animal being slaughtered. Uh, you need to allow for the blood to flow. Give it about 10, 15 minutes. Then you begin the skinning, etc. Uh, so very, very uh, stringent with regards to the rules and regulations that Islam has set out. I said Islam. Sometimes we do have Muslims who make a mess of matters. And you would see videos on social media, somebody is really treating this animal cruelly and badly, etc. And obviously we speak out with regards to that. As for Islam, then Islam has laid down the rules and the regulations and stuff like that. Excellent. Now, uh, the idea that uh, no, maybe let's help people with other stuff, uh, let's buy people maize and wheat, do that. Buy people the maize and the wheat and do all of this here. Sometimes it's just a talk shop. At well, I just like to make my opinion heard. You know, with all this money of Qurbani, we should rather uh, direct it somewhere else. Are you doing that? Would you do that? Would everybody agree with this? Yeah, no, it's not going to happen, Allah Subhanahu And also, we state that this Qurbani, this is an act of worship to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We get closer to Allah by doing this. And similarly with other charity, and there's a, there's a time for everything, inshallah. We remember Ibrahim alayhi salam. We remember the sacrifice of Ibrahim alayhi salam during this period here, right? And uh, uh, with regards to those places being affected, then yes, alhamdulillah, have them but don't stop your qurbani do the qurbani in fact if you can have them via your qurbani people need to eat right so have your qurbani done in maybe some of these affected areas and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best i think uh, we've covered those matters uh, sufficiently inshallah it's an act of worship we remember ibrahim alayhi salam it's part and parcel of our tradition and our culture nobody just well you know what uh, this year in america turkey uh, you know thanksgiving no more turkey this year uh, because it's uh, um, it's the credit crunch and it's uh, difficult so let's do away with that no <laughs> They would say that this is part and parcel of our culture and our tradition, and we've been doing this for 100 years, and we will continue even through tough times. What do you think about something like the matter of Qurbani? Wallahu ta'ala alam. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we move on to a generated question. Uh, what are the time periods between which my sacrifice, sacrifice needs to be done and distributed? Uh, Jayad, so... There's ikhtilaf amongst the ulama with regards to this matter. Everyone agrees that Eid day, obviously, Eid day is no issue at all. Uh, then the two days after Eid, so the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And there's also many other scholars who say that the 13th is also an option. Remember, when the person goes for Hajj, you have the five days of Hajj, and you also have that, uh, so you have the 8th, which is uh, the day at Mina, uh, then we have the ninth, which is the day of Arafah. Then the tenth, which is the day of Hajj. And then Ayam at Tashrik, the days of Tashrik in Mina. That's the eleventh and the twelfth. 
And also for those who want to stay, it's the 13th. It's the 13th, Jayid. And so we find many scholars of the opinion that the... They are the 10th, 11th and 12th, and also the 13th. And also the 13th. And this is also the opinion of the Hal Kibar Ulama in Saudi Arabia. Sheikh, Sheikh, so we have Sheikh, the 10th. Sheikh, we briefly missed one of your important points there. You were mentioning about Ayyam at Tashriq and then... <clears throat> so uh, we have Ayyam at Tashriq, which is uh, the 11th and the 12th. Okay. And when somebody goes for Hajj, we have the 10, five days of Hajj. And if you want to stay the 13th, you have one, you, you, that's an option for you, right? That's an option for you, the 13th. And so similarly for slaughter, many of the ulama state that you have Eid day, you have the two days of tashriq, and you also have the 13th. So in total, that would give us four days of slaughter, inshallah. But obviously, the best thing for you to do is what? Is to slaughter early, slaughter on the day of Eid, excellent. Many of the ulama state, you can slaughter at night, no problem. So you have the 10th, you have the 11th, you have the 12th, and inshallah, if you need, then the 13th also, inshallah. I can tell you by experience, last year, because, uh, alhamdulillah, via the imams on the Imam Development Program, we uh, facilitate slaughtering in about six African countries. The 10th, the 11th, the 12th, even the 13th, we were receiving orders from people, last minute, please, can I have an animal slaughtered? Alhamdulillah. So khair, inshallah. So those are the days, three, and maybe the fourth day, according to many, inshallah. Thank you. And Ayyam al Tashriq, are we allowed to fast or not? No, you, you don't fast on the days of Tashriq, Jayid. Uh, uh, those are the days of Eid. So you have Eid and you have the two days after Eid, etc. Prophet ﷺ states those are the days of eating and drinking. I mean, obviously, to moderation, inshallah. Right? I mean, but subhanAllah, remember the Sahaba and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what they would probably eat on the day of Eid and the days after Eid is maybe what we are eating on a daily basis. Uh, what, what they ate at the time of festival and festivities and Eid, we probably eat the same amount because my friend is in town and because we're going out to little Punjab or this restaurant or that restaurant, etc. Allah uh, Mustan, Allah Mustan. Remember our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one day he was walking the streets and he comes across that Sahabi Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, what, why are you walking around? Nothing but hunger, Ya Rasulullah. Why are you walking around at this time, Ya Rasulullah? Nothing but hunger. And then Umar the same day, out of hunger. I mean, probably we've never experienced this. You're so hungry, you can't even stay in your house and, and you like uh, walking outside like looking for something maybe you will find something subhanallah the habi invites them takes them to his house prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his uh, companions they eat something the best people who walk the face of this earth and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says wallahi we will have to answer to allah for this ni'mah what ni'mah we left our homes in a state of hunger and we go back to our homes with our bellies full Subhanallah, Chayid, half dead goat they had slaughtered, some dry bread they ate, and they are saying that we will have to answer to Allah for this ni'mah. Imagine the ni'am that we, myself and yourself, and the listeners and the audience and the viewers have to answer for, Subhanallah, Chayid. We are, like, at times drowning in luxury, drowning in luxury, Subhanallah, Allah, Subhanallah, Allah. Indeed, Allah has blessed us with a lot of luxury. And uh, thank you for clarifying. In moderation, we have to consume food. Um, also, Sheikh, advice to the business owners that have perhaps, uh, not all, some of them may have taken order more than the capacity. And uh, what's the best time or good time to start slaughtering? Is it after the first jama'at in the locality or can they even slaughter the first animal before the first Eid jama'at? No, no, no. I mean, the slaughtering should start after Salatul Eid, which wherever you are, Jaid. So you're in Australia, well, after Salatul Eid, you guys start slaughtering, inshallah. You guys in London, well, in London, after Salatul Eid. You're in South Africa, after Salatul Eid, in South Africa. You don't say no, no, no. Uh, well, you know, we are here in London, but Salatul Eid has taken place in Australia, so we will start our slaughtering. No, no, no. It's Salatul Eid in the place that you are at, Jaid. And then you have a must uh, let's say somebody in Canada, right? somebody in Canada, uh, he has delegated his animal to be slaughtered maybe in, in Pakistan, for example, in Pakistan, right? And maybe Pakistan's Eid is one day before the guy is in Canada, important. Maybe Salatul Eid and the day of Eid and the day of slaughter in Pakistan, which is a bit 
it's not, not, not the norm. Usually they are later. But anyway, uh, let's say Pakistan was one day earlier and Canada was one day later. Is it a problem if my uh, animal was slaughtered in Pakistan, but I, 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 I'm still one day later? No problem at all. It's all to do with the place where the animal is at that time. So if the animal is in Pakistan, they slaughter according to the Pakistan timetable. The animal is in South Africa based upon the South African timetable. What's the day of Eid in South Africa? What's the time of Eid in South Africa, etc. Every year you have this question. The guy says, you know what, uh, I, I'm in Canada or I'm in uh, London, but my animal has already gotten slaughtered there and we haven't even done Eid. No problem. It's to do with where the animal is at that time. Your agent, your agent, where they are based. They're based in Pakistan, in India, wherever the animal is, it's the time according to that place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakallah khair for that. Uh, inshallah, perfect time for us to go for a short break. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757. We're streaming it live on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. So please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook page, follow our Twitter handle. And of course, you can also follow our Instagram page. We're streaming it live on our website or via our website, imanchannel.tv. In conversation with Sheikh Bilal Ismail, inshallah, we'll be right back in a few moments. Do stay tuned with us. Don't go anywhere. Inshallah, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you very much.
Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757 in conversation with Sheikh Bilal Ismail. 0203515 0757. Our studio number 079-1684-1483. Our WhatsApp number. International viewers can use the WhatsApp number to call in directly into the studio. Today is an exception. It's the month of Zil Hijjah. So today the hour are different. It's between 6 to 7. However, back to normal from next week between 8 to 9. As always, Ask Iman on Iman channel. Now, Sheikh, let's move on to our next question. The next question will be taken from WhatsApp. Can I make intention from my for my missed fast from Ramadan when I'm fasting in the month of Dhul Hijjah? Jade, excellent. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the answer in short, yes, no problem at all. So, for example, somebody feels that the days of Dhul Hijjah, they want to fast from the first until the ninth. Jade, obviously, eight day we can't fast. So this person will be fasting. And he also has the intention that it would be his qawwa of Ramadan. In fact, my primary intention is that it is qawwa of Ramadan. And my secondary cherry on the top intention is that it is also from amongst the days of Dhul Hijjah. No problem, insha'Allah. And bi iznillahi ta'ala, you will get the reward of both, insha'Allah. Jayit, no problem, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for that. Again, a common question uh, in this period we always get. Can Qurban be offered on behalf of others? On behalf of others, others, what do you mean? Do you mean those who have passed away? Do you mean on behalf of your living uncle? What exactly do you mean? Or should we answer both? Uh, if you can kindly answer both, because the questioner hasn't specified. On behalf of your late mother, late father, grandfather, on behalf of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, on behalf of Imam Al-Bukhari, maybe you read a certain book by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, and you know, you really are fond of Imam Al-Tirmidhi, you are, were very fond of your great-great-grandfather, uh, maybe it's your great-great-grandfather who came from a certain country and set up the business in a certain country, and now, mashallah, you know, this is like an empire that has been built, so you want to slaughter something on their behalf. Is it permissible? The answer is yes. No problem at all, inshallah. And it's also akin to like uh, charity on their behalf. It's like charity on their behalf. Because the animal will be slaughtered and then the meat will be distributed, etc. And they will, be izinillahi ta'ala, earn the thawab and earn the reward, walhamdulillah. So that's with regards to those who have passed away. Then with regards to performing qurbani on behalf of the living, then what exactly does that mean? If you mean like uh, the husband in the house, he says, you know what, wife, uh, you don't worry about the qurbani this year. I will sort it out on your behalf. I will pay for it on your behalf. No problem at all. She's willing. He's willing. It's fine. Uh, maybe the father says that, uh, you know what, all my adult sons uh, this year, I want to slaughter all of the qurbani on you people's behalf. You don't pay for it. No problem at all. Alhamdulillah. Uh, but an issue could arise if, for example, uh, especially according to the Hanafi school of jurisprudence, where the ruling of Qurbani is that it's not recommended, but rather it is wajib. It's an obligation, obligation. Remember, majority of the ulama state that Qurbani, Udhiya, is a sunnah. You do it, alhamdulillah. You don't do it, there's no sin. Whereas the Hanafi scholars state, no. It is wajib. It's wajib. You have to do it. You have to do it. And also, it's wajib upon every individual who pays zakat. So there's two major differences between majority and the Hanafi scholars. Number one, majority say it's sunnah. The Hanafi state, it's wajib. Number two, the majority states that it is sunnah and one animal can suffice for the whole household. Like uh, you have a husband, you have a wife, you have three kids. One animal minimum for the whole household suffices. Whereas the Hanafi scholars state, no, rather it's wajib upon every person who pays zakah. The husband pays zakah, he must sort out. The wife pays zakah, she must sort out. And so because it's an obligation here, the husband should not just go along and do it on his wife's behalf without her knowledge and consent. It's an obligation. She was supposed to sort out. Right? And so if he tells her, you know what, I will sort out your qurbani, she says, oh, I'm so happy, alhamdulillah. And then he does it, then it's fine, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. And Allah you. knows best. 
Thank you very much for that. Moving on swiftly to our next question, and this time it will be from YouTube. If I join the Imam in the standing position and the Imam goes to Rukur and I don't recite Surah Al-Fatiha because I know I'll miss my Rukur, is my prayer valid? Jayid, excellent question. Your prayer is 100% valid, inshallah. Your Ruku, so you came there and you joined Allahu Akbar. Uh, Jayid, you say Allahu Akbar. And the Imam was, Allahu Akbar. He's gone in Ruku. You didn't get a chance to recite Surah Al Fatiha. All you might have said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil. If you were of that opinion that you were supposed to be reciting behind him, that's all you read. And the Imam is now in Ruku. Do you join him in Ruku or do you continue reciting Surah Al Fatiha? Or you come to the masjid, forget that. The Imam is already in Ruku. He's already in Ruku. You say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and you go down into Ruku. Now the question is, did you catch that Raka'ah? Did you catch that Raka'ah? The answer is yes. If you caught the Ruku, you caught the Raka'ah. Repeat. If you caught the Ruku, you caught the Raka'ah, insha'Allah. Right? And that's the opinion of the Hanafis, the Shafi'is, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, a uh, majority of the ulama, Ibn Taymiyyah, etc. That you catch the Ruku, you have caught the Raka'ah, insha'Allah. There's very few scholars who are of the opinion that no, uh, if you didn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha, there's a mushkila, there's a problem, and you need to repeat that uh, rak'ah, etc. That's a super minority opinion. Most of the ulama state, what's the rule? You catch the ruku, you have caught the rak'ah, and Allah knows best, walhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, because you've mentioned as an example, you've given Pakistan, so there was, mashallah, a good question, uh, and a common question every year, we get this question. When fasting the day of Arafah, should we do it according to the actual day as per Saudi or should we do it according to the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, wherever we are in the world? For example, in Pakistan uh, or even in Bangladesh, um, everything is usually a day later. Jayid, khair, inshallah. So, ala kulli hal, there is valid, important, underline the word valid. There is valid ikhtilaf with regards to this matter. Like there is valid ikhtilaf with regards to local sighting or global sighting. Some ulama state, global sighting, the man sees the moon in China, we must all fast with that. And there's also the opinion of local sighting. No, no, no. Each area, location, each uh, uh, land mass uh, follows its own sighting. So there's valid ikhtilaf. From the time of the Sahaba, the scholars, etc., have been divided into these two camps. And there's no problem. Each one should respect the other, bi ta'ala. And so in this matter here, uh, because there is valid ikhtilaf in this matter, if you follow what you believe in your country, so, so, so if you are, let's say you are one day behind Saudi Arabia, when are you making Eid? You are making Eid one day after Saudi Arabia. You believe today is Eid. Yesterday was Eid in Saudi Arabia, but you believe today is Eid. Similarly, the day before, the day before you believed it was Arafah, whereas in Saudi it was it was uh, the day of Eid, Jaid. You follow what you believe, insha'Allah, Jaid. What you are following and what the majority of the ulama in your country are following. Because the ikhtilaf origin, the origin of this matter is to do with the moon sighting. We have this difference because there was a difference in the moon sighting. Some started the month on Monday, some started the month on Tuesday. And them starting the month on Monday or Tuesday was this. A valid type of difference of opinion? The answer is yes. Some said global and some said local sighting. And so because the origin of the matter was based upon a valid difference of opinion, the fruits that come out of it would also be legitimate, inshallah. Right? The relationship, the matter at the beginning was legitimate. So whatever comes out of it, the fruits would also be legitimate. And so maybe a good idea would be that uh, if Saudi is one day before you, inshallah, then when it is Arafat in Saudi, you fast. And then the following day, it's 9th of Dhul Hijjah in your land, in your town, in your city. Then you fast again, mashallah. So you saved yourself. You've got yourself on the safe side, inshallah. If it was there, you got it. If it was here, you also got it. Walhamdulillah. And Allah knows best.
Thank you very much. Literally, we have got a one and a half uh, minute. Uh, if we can cover this question from YouTube. Can we recite Quran in a room where there are pictures of living creatures, humans, and cartoons painted on the wall? Khair, inshallah. Is it permissible? The answer is yes. Is it a good thing to have those images and those pictures up? Absolutely not. Two different matters, right? So is it permissible for you to recite Quran there? The answer is yes. Right? You're in a shopping center. There's a lot of haram that happens there. Right? Can you recite Quran there? Yes, you can. Right? Uh, and similarly, with regards to this room, maybe whoever's room it is, advise them to take down those images, take down those pictures, etc. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Jazakallah khair for that. Uh, that's Sheikh Bilal Ismail in conversation. And alhamdulillah, been answering your questions. 0203. 515-0757, our student number, 0791684-1483, our WhatsApp number. Thank you to all our viewers who are sending us questions either using the WhatsApp or YouTube or Facebook. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. We'll be asking those questions and we'll continue asking those questions after the short break. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, please call in. Once again, 0203 515 Five seven our student number and please don't forget to like share comment and subscribe to all our platforms including our facebook page our youtube channel follow our twitter handle and this program is also streamed live via website imanchannel.tv we'll be right back in a few moments thank you very much
Welcome back to the last segment of Ask Iman on Sky 757 on Iman channel in conversation with Sheikh Bilal Ismail. 0203-515-0757, our studio number 0791684143, our WhatsApp number. Thank you to all our viewers for sending us questions via WhatsApp, our YouTube channel, and of course, you're watching it live on our Facebook page and of course on our YouTube channel. So once again, humble reminder, please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to our Facebook page, YouTube channel. And this program is also uh, streamed live via website imanchannel.tv. Sheikh, we'll move on to our next YouTube, YouTube question from Sister Tabassum Fatima. She's asking, Sir, can I shorten and combine my prayers while travelling from my residence country to my home country? Can I pray Dhuhr and Asr before boarding plane and pray Maghrib and Isha after reaching home? Sheikh. Jayyid, khair, inshallah. Uh, so the first matter, that wherever you might be traveling from or to, the fact that you are a traveler, the fact that you are a musafir, then you can avail yourself of the, uh, uh, of the discount and the concessions granted to a traveler. So, for example, there's a brother, he's got a home in Australia and he's got a home in the UK. So when he's traveling between his two houses, is he a musafir? The answer is yes. But he's going from one home to another. Irrelevant. The fact that it's far, the fact that it's more than plus minus 86, 87 kilometers, then he is regarded as a musafir, inshallah. Jayid. So that's the first matter. Uh, the second part was uh, they wanted to join between where? Um, he says, can I pray Zuhr and Asr before boarding plane and pray Maghrib and Isha after reaching home? Okay, Zohar and Asr before boarding the plane. As long as you are a musafir by that time, meaning, uh, let's say your, 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 the airport, your airport is outside the city limits, then when you get to the airport, you are already a musafir, right? But if the airport's down your road, it's like five kilometers down the road, it's still in the city and stuff like this here, yeah, then technically at the airport, you're not a musafir as yet. You are not a musafir as yet. Maybe the flight that you are taking, it's going to be very difficult for you to perform salah on the flight. So then at Zuhr time, even though you're not a traveler, even though you're not a musafir yet, because it's going to be very difficult on the flight to perform asr, you could avail yourself of the concession of joining between the two prayers, even though you are not shortening the prayer. So you will pray Zuhr Salah 4, and then directly after that you will pray Asr Salah 4, and this is done in Zuhr time. Why are you doing this? Because I'm going to take this flight now, and I'm not going to be able to pray my Salatul Asr on the flight. It's going to be very difficult, etc., etc. So here we find that many of the ulama of the opinion, especially like the Hanbali scholars and others, that uh, here you are joining because of the hajjah. You are joining because of the need. You're not joining because you're a traveler. You're joining because of the need in the situation. Jade, you're not shortening. Shortening is only attached to travel. Whereas joining between two salawat is attached to difficulty. So you would join your zuhur and asr at the airport uh, for, for if you're not yet a musafir. And if you are already a musafir, depending on where the airport's location, uh, then you read two and two for Zuhr and Asr. And then they say that when they reach, wherever they reach, then they will pray the Maghrib and the Isha. Yes, no problem, inshallah. If, uh, uh, if, if you reach your destination, which is your own home, obviously you're not a musafir in your own home, and then you will pray uh, three rak'ahs uh, for Maghrib and four rak'ahs full of Salatul Isha because you're no longer a traveler. But if you pray it before you reach that residence, then you will pray three rak'ahs and two rak'ahs for Salatul Maghrib because you are a traveler. We hope you got that, inshallah, and Allah knows that. Thank you very much. Next question from YouTube again, uh, Anonymous. If I give money to family abroad to do Qurbani over there, when is the earliest I can cut my hair? When I pray Eid Salah, uh, for example, in, the, in London, or when the actual Zibah is done, for example, abroad, either Pakistan or Bangladesh, etc.? Jayid, excellent, excellent. So when the actual animal is slaughtered, that's when it would be permissible for you, Jayid. So uh, when the animal is slaughtered in India, in Pakistan, wherever, then it would be permissible, inshallah, for you to trim your nails, inshallah, Jayid. And this mas'ala of uh, 
uh, not trimming one's nails or cutting hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is a good thing to do. It's a lovely thing to do. It's wonderful. It's good. Alhamdulillah. And we hope bi Taala Allah Subhanahu wa Taala rewards you for that, inshaAllah. But some people feel that if I trim my nails or I cut my hair, this is a sin. I, I am sinful. Some even ask that, uh, okay, uh, I didn't know, subhanAllah, by mistake, you know, I cut some hair, etc. Uh, what's the kafara? What's the penalty? Do I need to give some charity because of this? Do I need to slaughter another animal because of this? The answer is no, 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 no. And Jayet, there's no sin at all. There's no sin at all upon you, Jayet. And that's the opinion of majority of the ulama. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Uh, thank you. Next question is interesting, Sheikh. On YouTube, Brother Muhammad Aqil is asking, um, Sir, if a person watch mobile phone in bathroom, will he be sinful? So, so somebody is watching something on their mobile phone Correct. while in the bathroom. Correct. Okay, Jade. Well, the first thing, Doctor, is what are you watching? Jade, what are you watching? Uh, because the sin is attached to what exactly you are watching. If you are watching something which is haram, whether you're watching it in your bedroom or in the lounge or in your car, it's a sin, wherever it might be. Uh, but uh, specific to the bathroom, the toilet, uh, let's say you are watching some Islamic lecture. No, you, that's not the place for you to be watching something like that. Uh, uh, something that has the name of Allah. You are watching some recitation oh, of the Noble Quran, listening listening to an Ashid or listening to uh, Quran, listening to something where they're taking the name of Allah. Obviously, this is not appropriate for you to be watching in the, uh, in the bathroom, etc. Uh, but let's say you're watching... Uh, Ah, yeah, you're news. watching uh, news. watching news or you're watching uh, uh, National Geographic, a documentary or something. And uh, for whatever reason, you're having a shower and you have it there and, you know, you're having a shower and you're still watching it because you don't want to miss something. Uh, that's not a sin. That's not a sin. Your phone might uh, not work properly, so but that's not a then. sin. Yes, definitely okay. for the long life of your phone, inshallah. Thank you. Ala ala. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm intending to fast on the, uh, nine, the first nine days of Zul Hijjah, inshallah. During this time, I'll be traveling abroad, but I also want to keep the fast. Should I just make up for days in which I'm traveling, uh, in which I'm traveling afterwards? Make up for days that you are traveling. Um, yeah. there's, no, there's no need to make up anything. I mean, if somebody wants to fast during the nine days of Zul Hijjah, fast, alhamdulillah. And if you are traveling and you don't fast, don't fast. But there's nothing for you to make up. There's no need for you to do any qaba. It's not like Ramadan. If you miss a fast, you need to make qaba or something of the sort. So I'm traveling. I fasted the first, the second, then the third and the fourth I was traveling. So I didn't fast. Do I need to make qaba? No, no qaba, nothing. Nothing upon you at all, alhamdulillah. And somebody didn't fast at all during the days of the hijjah no sin on him at all. He lost out maybe on some great reward, but there's no sin upon the individual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Thank you very much. Next question from YouTube. How many times can I pray istikhara? As uh, many times as you require, Jahid. Uh, no, there's no limit with regards to Salatul Istikhara, Jahid. Uh, so you make Salatul Istikhara, alhamdulillah. Uh, your heart is still not... Uh, uh, set on something, then make Salatul Istikhara again, Jayid, and plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to settle your heart. And I mean, you also take a decision. You also take a decision in the Salatul Istikhara dua. What do we say? Oh Allah, this decision that I've taken, whatever it might be, if it is good for me, if it's good for my deen and my dunya, guide me to it, make it easy for me. And if it is bad for my deen and my dunya, then make it difficult and keep me away from it. Now. Oh, thank you very much. Next question on WhatsApp. It's, I believe, related to the discussion we are having. Um, if fard and wajib both mean compulsory, what is the difference? Enjoy it. Uh, so the Hanafi scholars, they have a distinction between fard and wajib. So fard is something which was established by unequivocal evidence. Unequivocal evidence. No there's no doubt about the certainty with regards to this matter. It's like, uh, it's like uh, somebody taking a candle and he touched the candle, he touched the flame, and he got burnt, right? He felt the heat. 
Now, his level of knowledge with regards to the flame burning him is different from somebody else who looks at the flame. And somebody says to him, you know, if you touch it, you are going to get burnt. Yeah, you think so? If I touch it, I'll get burnt? Um, okay, okay, I, I believe you, I'll get burnt. There's a difference between the two. One guy has experienced it. One guy, he's 100% haqqul yaqeen with regards to this matter. He felt he got burnt. And the other guy, he's been informed. Many trustworthy people have told him that it will burn him. And so he trusts them, right? Uh, but there's a difference between the two levels. And similarly, so the Hanafis make a distinction between fard and wajib. That fard is on that like super high level, whereas wajib is not on that super high level. Salatul fajr is fard. Salatul zuhr is fard. Salatul asr is fard. Whereas witr salah, according to the Hanafis, would fall in the category of wajib, inshallah. Majority of the ulama generally don't make any distinction mm-hmm. between fard and wajib. You would find a scholar saying salatul fajr is wajib. Salatul Fajr is fard, Zuhar Salah is fard, Zuhar Salah is wajib. To him, it, 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 either, exactly. either, both the terms can be used interchangeably. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And maybe we end off here, inshallah. Perfect timing. Jazakallah khair. That's all we have time for. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Bilal Ismail. Inshallah, hope to see you again. Until next time, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum. Mm.